Gates, Kasiki, Clothing. Just a reminder, uh, reception will be after Marcelli's talk uh, upstairs in 401. Uh, so today we're very pleased to have Marcelli Suarez Santos from Fermilab. Uh, Marcelli is an associate scientist and equivalent to assistant professor uh, in the experimental astrophysics group at Fermilab. Uh, Marcelli got her PhD from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Sao Paulo, if you don't know, it's sort of it's the Chicago of Brazil. Um, it's the big city that works. Um, and uh, she was, uh, as a student, she got a fellowship in um, So uh, she got a fellowship and uh, started working with people at Fermi Lab. Uh, and completed her PhD in 2010. Uh, and uh, we snapped her up as a postdoctoral fellow at Fermilab, uh, where she won the Alvin Tolstrom Award uh, for the best postdoctoral research. Uh, and so it was clear that we had to uh, keep her. So uh, two years ago, myself became an associate scientist at Fermilab. She's been uh, one of the real leaders uh, uh, and has been involved in the Dark Energy Survey Project. Uh, for many years, uh, did lots of uh, important work in the instrument, uh, and uh, in the last couple of years, uh, I should mention, uh, before that she did uh, important work on uh, weak gravitational lensing with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, pioneered new methods for uh, detection of clusters of galaxies and optical survey, among others. Uh, in recent years, she's pioneered this new avenue uh, for DES and optical surveys, uh, which is uh, using DES um, uh, to search for the optical counterparts of gravitational waves. Some of you may have heard there's this little project called LIGO. Um, we found some, some events last year. It was kind of, yeah, it was, kind of, it was interesting. But the real interesting uh, gravitational wave astronomy will really become exciting of course, when we start to find electromagnetic counterparts uh, to these events. Uh, and that's, uh, and Marcelli uh, is really spearheading that effort. So today she's going to tell us about the Dark Energy Survey and Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction and also for the invitation to speak here. It's wonderful to be in this room, this beautiful room, and see so many uh, friendly, familiar faces, uh, uh, colleagues. Um, and um, it's always a pleasure to talk about this project. I'm very excited about it. So um, let me start a little bit um, with um, a motivation overall for, for DES. When DES was conceived, the idea was not, um, I think no, nobody thought about using this to do anything related to gravitational waves. The motivation at the time was related to um, the accelerating expansion of the universe that we observe, uh, we, we have um, observed since uh, quite a while, and we want to understand what is the physics driving this accelerated expansion. We don't know what it is. We have a, a, a great name for it we call it dark energy. And so the dark energy survey is meant to, uh, to help um, clarify or, or help us understand what is um, that is causing the, this uh, accelerated expansion of the universe. And, um, I would like here just to, um, let's say, remind people of, okay, how, how do we go about doing this, right? So imagine you wake up in the morning and with the um, um, desire to understand the expansion of the universe, one way of doing it is to go about measuring the distance redshift relation. And I know that uh, for many people in this room this is um, well known. Uh, the idea here is that, well, uh, as photos travel from a galaxy far, far away until um, our telescope here, the wavelength of these photos gets stretched out, and that's the redshift. And so if I can map out for a certain class of objects in the universe, um, I can uh, build a plot of distance versus redshift, this plot, the shape of this curve here, will tell us about the history of expansion of the universe. And this has been um, done in the past, and um, a survey like the ES, for instance, would be able to do this. And there, to uh, make this type of measurement, you need uh, a way to measure distances. 
And the traditional ways that um, people go about it are, for instance, via standard candles packed on a supernova that I'm, I'm pretty sure you, uh, you know uh, a lot more than I do about it, um, where uh, you have standard candles here and you go and measure their apparent magnitudes and use that as your distance indicator. Another way to go about it is uh, to use some standard distance in the universe, for instance, the characteristic scale of the uh, interactions in the early universe, the limiting print in the distribution of galaxies that we observed is the map from the SPSS, just for illustration purposes. And um, as you can you can see here, the distribution is the distribution is not random. There is a characteristic scale that is uh, corresponding to this BAO scale. So these would be um, two different ways of going about building a distance redshift relation or measuring uh, the expansion history of the universe. And we want multiple methods because if there are systematics associated with one method, uh, we want to be able to mitigate those systematics by having independent uh, other types of methods out there. Now, is the distance, um, is the uh, expansion history the only way that dark energy affects the universe? No. Uh, dark energy also will affect the growth of structures in the universe. So the formation of these spectacular galaxy clusters will be, mitig will be uh, suppressed in the presence of dark energy. And we can use that to measure dark energy parameters uh, in the universe. So this is just illustrating uh, the evolution from uh, early on, early stages of the universe very smooth to the present where uh, you see a lot more structure and how fast these structures form and how much uh, growth you have along, the time, along uh, this process is, um, is also another observable and it's a different observable from the other two and it's also complementary to it. So to take advantage of that, one way of uh, uh, going about it is uh, via weak lensing or via uh, just cluster number counts. Both of them will be sensitive to these quantities and can be used as a probe for dark energy. So um, with these um, observables in mind, um, I think the logical conclusion is that if you want to build an experiment to study dark energy, you probably want to build an experiment um, like this. You want something that will cover a large area of the sky with good image quality and uh, uniform uh, now, enough that you can build catalogs of galaxies and measure growth of structure, measure with planting, etc. And also, you want to um, do a supernova survey um, to do this spreadsheet relationship. And we do that in DES. So, DES is um, a 5,000 square degree survey. This is the relevant region of the sky in the southern hemisphere. Um, and to depth of 24th magnitude. In addition to this large area here, we also have 10 fields uh, where we revisit analytic the cadence of about once a week for uh, detection of supernova. Um, and the survey is um, ongoing, and we have a total of 525 nights over five years to complete the survey. To accomplish this, we built the camera called the Dark Energy Camera, or DCAM. This picture is one of my favorite pictures um, of the camera. That's the focal plane of the camera while it was still here at Fermilab before shipping to before shipping um, uh, to Chile. And I I'm very proud to have helped um, build this um, this camera in, in. and um, so in total. So this is three thousand three square degree field of view and uh, five hundred seventy megapixels. And the camera is installed in the Blanco 4 meter telescope. So it's a great combination of wide field of view and, um, and also a, a large collecting uh, area. And the first light was in 2012, and since then we are operating. The survey is now in its fourth season. We currently have this entire area covered about four times to five times, and the goal is to uh, have it covered ten times in the bands GRI and Z and why uh, after the end of the survey. This is just an eye candy view of uh, the site, um, and I like to show this often to my colleagues in particle physics to show them how um, much more awesome um, the sites we have uh, than they are. I mean, just think about going underground to do experiments, it's, I don't understand why people would rather do that than this. 
so this is the, the, the building of Blanco, and Blanco is a uh, telescope that was built in the 70s, and it's a massive structure, and uh, in some sense, it's per per perfectly suited for this uh, massive camera that we have there uh, installed there. So, um, all right. So here is a plot that is uh, showing projections for once the survey completes is completed, five years what we expect to obtain in terms of these two parameters of dark energy, the current value of uh, uh, the W parameter and the first derivative. The idea is that we'll be able to, by combining these multiple probes, uh, we'll be able to make a measurement with an uncertainty of about 5% of the current value and about 30%, which is much better than uh, what we have today because, uh, well, today our constraints are uh, about a factor of three to five larger than that. So um, that is the, the, the main goal, and uh, it's been a, a lot of uh, fun to me, and it's been um, exciting to be part of this project. Now, this could be the end of the story, but it's not. The, what happened is, well, okay, uh, let me just summarize it here that we are, the survey is still ongoing, we are in, you start in year four of data taking, but um, we already have over 70 papers, most of them are in describing um, astroph astrophysics, so in clusters, weak lensing, etc., that are building towards the cosmological measurements, which are coming soon as well. Um, but I'm going to focus in this talk on uh, the initiative of pursuing gravitational waves uh, or pursuing the optical counterparts to the gravitational waves that light detects. And, um, and the goal here is that perhaps this could be a new observable that we could add to our repertoire and improve our systematic uncertainties in dark energy. So I'm going to present here today it's a very um, particular selection of results, right? So for the more traditional with lensing cluster supernova results, um, I will um, I will say we can talk about that um, after the talk or uh, more better yet, uh, redirect to some of our colleagues in the room who are experts and have been contributing a lot to those efforts in DES. Okay, so without further ado, let me um, talk a little bit about what are the opportunities for uh, astrophysics research that the uh, detection of the gravitational wave mergers um, enable, right? So there are a number of things, there's something for everyone, I think, um, including, for instance, in understanding the astrophysics of these mergers, mergers of compact objects, neutral star, neutral star, black holes, etc. Um, but also, perhaps, the possibility of doing cosmology. And the idea here would be that we would use um, these events as standard sirens. The idea would be that the distance information would come from the gravitational wave events. And that would be analogous to, standard, to the way that supernova are used as standard candles. And from that, we could obtain cosmology. And uh, there are other ideas as well, including well, one, uh, the idea that perhaps if our colleagues in the neutrino sector uh, actually get um, uh, to the point of detecting neutrinos from the same events, we could actually have the first time real, like three different particles from the same type of events. It would be awesome. Um, okay, so let me uh, talk about the, the standard siren motivation a little bit. This is a cartoon illustration of how that would work. So the idea is you have a, a system, for instance, with a, a binary neutral star system. Uh, when they merge, we know they emit gravitational waves and we know that our colleagues in LIGO can uh, detect them. Um, and more than that, we know that they can get the distance in megaparsec to that event from uh, the uh, gravitational wave signal alone. Now, on the other hand, if we can detect the electromagnetic counterpart, for instance, uh, an emission that would look like, the, in this cartoon here, these flux are in arbitrary units, um, but the time scale will be something like about 10 days to two weeks, and um, we would observe a transient in the sky like this, well, we could use this information to get the redshift of the of the transient itself or of its host. And from there, we could build a Hubble diagram and go and, and do cosmology in sim a similar way that we do with uh, other uh, with standard candles um, in the universe. 
So this is a cartoon illustration. So and to me, it's like I look at this cartoon every day in the morning to motivate myself to think, okay, that's what I want to do. Um, and so in, with the yes, the avenue that we we can pursue here is try to uh, uh, finish this diagram from this side, right? Try to detect the electromagnetic counterparts. So that's the motivation, and then we started this um, project uh, in 2013 uh, based on this. Since then, we came a long way building a collaboration, I mean, or building an effort within the DES collaboration, also collaborating with members of um, uh, the LIGO uh, verbal collaboration, some of which are here in the room, and uh, also with non-DES users of the dark energy camera who are also involved in similar uh, pursuits. Um, and I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to show that we developed a, an analysis and a system where we are sensitive to neutral star neutral star or black hole neutral star mergers up to about 200 megaparsec. Um, depending, I will, I will uh, go into details and say what are the caveats that this that lead to this number. Um, of course, as you know, oops, we did not detect a counterpart last year. And as it turns out, um, we learned as well that the event. Uh, the two events that we uh, pursued last year did not have any neutral star in them. Um, but the prospects for the future are good, and we are excited, planning for the next round uh, to start very, very soon. Um, we, and we also, I, I should mention, um, were able to get some support to, uh, to fund this, this development and also uh, additional telescope time to pursue the program. So uh, how does it work? Uh, how do we do this in, in let's say, in practice, right? So uh, here I'm showing a, a table that I got here from uh, a reference from the Life Collaboration, showing a timeline for their plans to ramp up uh, until uh, running with design sensitivity uh, with three detectors. The initial run, the observing run one, had only the LIGO detector and uh, lasted for three months. And in that case, we saw uh, a, we saw two events with high significance, and there was a third event with lower significance. Um, I think it's spectacular the fact that like this table, although it's from 2013, it seems it's still so right. Um, and um, right now we are going into this uh, observing season, observing round number two that should last twice as long and should have increased sensitivity. And the plan is to go on and, and, uh, and increase in sensitivity um, uh, year by year. Uh, and also length of uh, the run. So eventually you would have the detector running um, year round and uh, events coming in at a rate that could reach something like once a week or more. Okay. Um, and how, does it, how do we pursue this? So the idea is when an event happens, we receive a trigger, and from that trigger, we um, we get information such as well, timestamp when it happened. Uh, it's kind of I'm going to show later how it looks like. Distance information and information about the type of event. Um, uh, the idea is that within 24 hours, we can get organized to map out and image as much as possible of the area of high probability for that event and uh, then process these images and come up with plausible candidates for the optical counterpart. Um, so challenges. One of them is that the area that we have to cover is really large. So what you see here is the median of the area um, as a function of confidence level that we want to cover. Here is for the case of um, two uh, detectors, the two light detectors, and here would be the case where you would add a third detector, such as Virgo. The plan is that Virgo uh, should join the observing runs in the near future. So, um, as you can see, it is uh, not trivial to cover these large areas. It's very challenging. And, and although uh, the situation will improve by, see, by a lot once we have three detectors operating. Um, but although this is challenging, we have um, an instrument that is very well matched to this. So this is the field of view of the cam illustrating here. Uh, you can see the field of view of the cam uh, imaging uh, the small Magellanic cloud, and this is one of the images taken uh, early on in 2012, soon after we turned on the camera. 
and uh, I think this is really spectacular, and um, it's a, a three degree, um, three square degree field of view, and that um, makes it makes the job of searching not I wouldn't say trivial, but to make it possible for us to search. And this camera on a four meter telescope means we can go deeper, and so we can overall do a search that is uh, wider and faster than uh, other facilities. And in particular in the southern hemisphere, uh, it's very hard to match this. So, um, so it looks like we have everything we need to uh, put the program in action. So I'm going to illustrate how this happened with event number one, which was the big GW-15 on 914. Um, so this is how it happened. So when the trigger happened, and this is uh, true for uh, subsequent events as well. Uh, by a trigger, what it, basically what it means is like, okay, we get a, a, a link to a map. And first thing we do, we plot the map and put the DS footprint on top of it because we are very DS centric. So uh, this is for event number one. Uh, the color coding here represents the probability that the event came from each pixel in the sky. And as you can see, it overlaps a little bit with the DS footprint, but it's a huge area in the sky. In this case, the distance to this event was 410 megaparsec. We know it's a, it was a binary black hole merger. At the time, we did not get all these information. All we got at the time was um, the map and um, uh, an estimate of the false alarm rate, so an estimate of how uh, the signal to noise. Okay? So, fine, now we have a map. We know more or less where it is in the sky, and it's a huge area. What do we do next? Well, next we have to figure out where to point the telescope. And this type of map helps us a lot. So this map, here there's no LIGO information. This map is only a model of what would be the limiting magnitude that we could reach at each pixel in the sky for that particular night. So uh, with a fiducial exposure time of 90 seconds in IBAN. Um, so this gives you an idea that's like, okay, it's hopeless so they're here or here because, well, the sun's on the way. Um, uh, the Earth is on the way, right? Um, and there are certain areas that are less likely, for instance, because the Milky Way is uh, there causing extinction and so on. But right here is a good area. So this helps us inform which subset of that entire ring in the sky that we are going to actually be able to, to observe. Now, next, we make assumptions about the source. And in this case, what we did, we, we assumed that, okay, let's assume that it is a system where there is a neutral star. We didn't know that it was a binary black hole event, right? And um, let's say that it is at a distance, which is um, a fiducial distance that LIGO tells us that they can see this event. Um, so now we know what would be the upper magnitude of that event. We have the ma limiting magnitude map. We can use that information to put a probability in each pixel that if the source is in that pixel in the sky, we would be able to see it. And that's what this map is showing us. And you can see, for instance, that here uh, the galaxy prevents us from achieving high probability. Here the LMC and the SMC also are on the way because these are crowded regions uh, that are very difficult to do uh, a detection there. But uh, you have an idea. So now you have these two probabilities. So what do you do? You multiply the two. And now the resulting map is uh, this much um, more, more compact region here that is the region that actually matters for us, the region that we are going to observe. So now we can make a plan for observing tonight. So the idea is that these maps here, we should produce them quickly enough so that we can make an observing plan for tonight. We don't want to waste any time because we know that the um, event is decaying in the time scale that is quite quick. So, okay, fine, we have this map, so now we are going to observe. And this is uh, the result for uh, event number one of the observations that we actually took. Um, our, okay, so here, let me explain just a little bit. Uh, and the dashed lines here correspond to the initial LIGO map that we received. The solid lines are the final map, the revised map between the initial version and the last version enough that it makes a, a big difference in this plot. Um, so we did our uh, calculations based on, based on this map, so this was the region. And it went right through the LMC, so this region was under, uh, was, um, 
at lower probability. So, um, but we thought that it was interesting enough that we should observe there as well. So we did some special observations there. So those are the orange hexes here. Each hex corresponds to one pointing, one pointing of the camera on the sky. And in total, we did 100 um, square degrees. And we did uh, in I band and Z band. Why these two bands? Because uh, the kilonova models are uh, predicted models are for a very red emission. So we are looking for I minus Z colors of about um, a, above 0.5 in, in, in this case. So color is a very good discriminant to, for instance, distinguish any potential candidate from a supernova or something like that. So we revisit the area in three epochs. The idea was that we were looking for a light curve that is um, decaying. Uh, we did not expect to see the rise of the light curve because we were on the sky already after 48 hours from the, the start of the event. So this table shows the three epochs. Um, when we were able with uh, this time, delta t in days from the trigger time. Um, we didn't cover everything in the first night, so we, we covered a little bit more area the following night, and then we did the second and third epoch. These are the observations on the LMC region. They were much shallower and, um, and covered this much area. Okay. So uh, this was the data set that we obtained for event number one. And so now uh, the question is, okay, so now what about the processing? We need to process these images and we need to do that quickly. So that's where I think uh, this product would not have been possible if we didn't have um, uh, the expertise from doing the supernova survey. So what we did was we adapted the supernova pipeline. This is um, a plot that I took from the um, um, supernova pipeline paper that we left. And um, so we adapted let's say, or uh, adapted the existing pipeline for, that was used for the supernova searches uh, to search here for these type of transients. And by adapting, what I mean was generalizing to the case where you don't have 10 fixed fields in the sky that you revisit all the time, but you're going to point anywhere at random in the sky, and you're going to use any available pre-existing DCAM image as a potential template. And they are all misaligned and taken at random because nobody knew that there was going to be a source there ahead of time. Um, and here I have just a, a little bit of uh, information about uh, the supernova survey for uh, because uh, for people to to know how that that is going. But I think the relevant part here is to highlight the um, the different imaging pipeline. So with that, so what we do, we take every image. So at some point, what we did was okay. Download every image that was ever taken by DCAM, be it a DES image or not, and um, as long as it's a public image. And then we process them with our own processing pipeline to make sure that every exposure is processed uniformly with the same code. Then uh, we can apply the difference imaging pipeline to actually um, detect a transient. This uh, processing takes a few hours per exposure, and this processing takes about an hour per job, where each job is one CCD. Um, so if we really want to turn around from raw images all the way to candidates in about 24 hours, that means we have to parallelize these jobs and be able to process them efficiently. So a lot of the effort that went on over uh, the past uh, year, two years, was uh, on automating and um, optimizing our system so that we are able to process the images quickly. And um, by now, we are in a situation where we can keep up with the rate that the images uh, come in and basically process them in real time. And this is uh, showing the load on the grid of the jobs that we had running for some test runs that we did in preparation for the second season. So in the first season, we didn't reach this goal of 24 hours of, pro of processing 
between uh, trigger time and candidates. But for season two, that's where we hope to be. So that means, for instance, that we will enable follow-up, spectroscopic follow-ups, and so on. All right, so let me change gears a little bit and talk uh, about the analysis of the data. So, okay, uh, trigger happened, we mapped the sky, we uh, analyzed, uh, we processed the images, so now we are going to do an analysis and look for candidates. So this was, uh, I'm going to call analysis one, which is covering every uh, uh, hex that I showed before in the data plot, except for the orange one, so every red hex there. So the total area was, as I mentioned, 100 square degrees. Um, once you subtract the LMC, the orange axis, you get 84 square degrees. Um, if you consider that, the not, that there is about 20% um, inefficiency in the, the fill factor of the camera, that amounts to 67 square degrees. And after difference imaging, we got a total of 40 square degrees. This last jump here in loss was due to the fact that the coverage, the template availability is not uniform. We wish that uh, actually we had DS like coverage everywhere in the sky, but we don't. So as you could see earlier, part of the region of interest of the first event went outside of the DES footprint. So in that area outside of the DES footprint, we rely on publicly available images from the community and they are sparse. They are not, the coverage there is not very good. Um, okay, so that's uh, the area budget. Then uh, now that we process, etc., now we have candidates and we can apply certain selection cuts. Um, so in our case, we were on sky more than 48 hours after the trigger had happened. So um, we are looking for a decaying part portion of a life curve. So the first thing we say is, okay, first thing I'm going to select is, well, things that have a good detection in the first epoch. First, uh, uh, that's, we, we, it's a non-starter, right? And then uh, we, we um, expect, uh, we require as well a second epoch with this signal to noise cut. And uh, cut number two here is we are requiring that the flux is declining between the first and second epoch. Finally, we apply a cut. The third epoch is more than two weeks later. So we apply a third epoch is that, that is if the candidate is still present three weeks later, that means um, that it's probably a slower decaying object, something like a supernova, for instance. So we reject those as well. Um, we apply these cuts to a, um, a um, fake fake events that were included to the, in the images. So that's another feature of the, of the pipeline that we use. We are able to add fakes according to a model. So um, we uh, were able to compute then what would be our recovery rate as a function of uh, depth and uh, estimate what is the 50% point there uh, where you cannot recover anymore in the candidates. And this gives us an idea of what's the depth. And based on this depth, uh, in assuming uh, a typical kilonova model, you can converge that into a distance to which we are sensitive, which in this case is um, 200 uh, megaparsec. So this is cool because um, this is close to the range out of which LIGO will be able to see kilonova at design sensitivity. So if this event would have been a binary neutral star event, uh, this uh, search would, be, would have been very, very meaningful in that sense. So here's, uh, okay, so this is the design of how, what we did, so the, and this is uh, the result. So this is number of events that pass each cut, showing that, well, not, not, no, no event survives, so we, do, we don't have detection, obviously. But um, that is, um, um, I think we, it, we are in a good position to repeat this um, this year. And um, an attempt to make a discovery. So, um, as I mentioned, we also did special observations on the area of the LMC. In that area, what we did was um, so, what is the motivation for doing that? 
We had little to no information about the nature of the event when we received the trigger. And the region of interest passed through the LMC in a way that was tantalizing, to say the least. So uh, the thinking was, OK, if it would be as close as the LMC, um, LIGO could have seen it if it were, for instance, a core collapse event as opposed to merger. And a core collapse event leading to a supernova would be something so obvious that you don't need the account to see. You step outside, look up, and you see biohazard, right? <laughs> Considering that we asked our colleagues to go there, like, look up, see if there's something. Uh, they said, no, there's nothing there. We were like, well, in this case, then, the alternative would be if uh, this would be one of those cases that have been hypothesized of core collapses that go directly into a black hole as opposed to uh, a supernova that is bright. And um, there have been uh, several searches for this type of disappearing stars. So we thought, well, uh, it's the LMC that's been well cataloged. We know what are all of the uh, potential uh, um, candidates to go through, uh, to go and, and suffer a core collapse. We can just look at them. In this case, we don't need different imaging pipeline. We can literally look at the images. It's, it's, it was a fun project actually to do. Uh, so uh, Jim and I spent a few days just like looking over uh, these images, and um, well, all of them are kind of form. No, none of them disappeared. And meanwhile, we all know it was not a core collapse event. Uh, so this um, um, is. I think it's still useful as a template for something that, that, that can be done in the future if uh, there are events um, that are not clearly a merger event, for instance, an uh, unmodeled burst event of lower significance, etc., where um, somebody could go even with a small telescope and look at the known red giants in that region of interest and look for a uh, core collapse, dark uh, core collapse event. Uh, this would be something that, that people could, could do with a small telescope. Well, DKM would be overkill for this, but, but it would be interesting. So that was analysis number two. Um, and then we thought, okay, we're done for the season, it's over. And, but it wasn't over yet. We had event number three. Um, well, okay, this was, we're calling it number two here because for us it was number two. Uh, it was the second event that we followed up. Um, LIGO also had another event in between that was lower significance, but this one we didn't receive a trigger for it, so we didn't, we didn't, didn't exist to us. So this event happened shortly after Christmas, so great, uh, uh, right uh, in the middle of the holidays. And um, from our point of view, its localization was terrible, because it's very far north and it was setting at this time, early, early in the evening. Uh, but still, we were able to do a few observations covering part of the high, high probability region. Uh, and this is the, uh, the red uh, hexes here are the hexes we covered. In this case, there was no tantalizing overlap with anything on the sky, so we didn't do anything special like we did for the first event. Uh, the yellow here is uh, the contour of the DS range. By now, you should know by heart where it is on the sky. Um, and uh, this plot in particular is for the uh, done for like for the end of the first night. So the part of the sky that was the, uh, actually not the end. It's at one, two a.m. You think? Um, okay. So for event number two here, um, we did a search. So the idea was uh, similar, although the, this event was less exciting than the first one from the point of view of the localization area in the sky. Um, it was exciting from the point of view also of testing uh, an alternative pipeline um, that our collaborators at um, Harvard have for diffuse imaging and looking into it. So um, this analysis was done there. And for a brief moment, we were quite excited because we had a candidate. Yay. So this, is, this was uh, um, uh, the candidate. So uh, Galaxy here, candidate appears and goes away and passes the, the basic cuts that we have, right? Now, um, the excitement was short-lived because we learned that this was actually a supernova that was in a stage and color and so on that passed our cuts. So this was the background uh, event. 
and what was interesting, at least to me, things that we learned from this exercise was, well, um, for instance, pre-existing templates would have helped us uh, reject those. So here in this case, what we did, we did four epochs, and you use the last epoch as a template for the other three. The idea was to, ask, to, to test if we could get away with this technique in the cases where there's no template available from the community. And the answer is, well, in a pinch we could do it, but it's um, problematic because, for instance, this type of background could have been eliminated if we had pre used the pre-existing templates. Later, when we did that, they show up there. And also, the other... Um, Important thing is like if we had started observing earlier, uh, we would have um, noticed that this did not have a rise and then fall. It was falling all the way from 90 days before uh, the trigger, and we would see that that it's clearly not our candidate. Um, and um, our limitation here in getting sooner on sky have to do with. Uh, in part with how soon we got the trigger from our uh, LIGO colleagues and also with um, uh, scheduling and, and so on of the telescope. But um, it's, a, it's very important to, do, to be on sky as quickly as possible um, for this search. And this is a um, yeah, second result. So um, in the, try to put things uh, uh, back together here. So we've come a long way since uh, 2013 when uh, the LIGO collaboration invited the astronomical community to get together and um, make um, uh, programs that would search for electromagnetic counterparts to their events. Um, since then, I think we formed a productive uh, collaboration, that in, in a productive and a broad collaboration, including um, a, a broad uh, coverage of, of uh, people who use VCAM for uh, in the community, also members of LIGO, etc. Uh, we were able to do follow-up searches of uh, the two high significance events of last year and produce the three um, papers that are here. Um, and the idea is that in the future, um, in the future, I think that this, this, this plot is uh, uh, showing here the uncertainties or expectations for uncertainties on H naught as a function of number of neutral star neutral star mergers that we can that, that, that we detect, right? So, and as you can see, we are not talking about thousands of events to get to a certainty level of a few percent. With 20 or 30 events, we would already be at the level where we would have a completely independent method for determining H naught and actually be able to have something to say, for instance, in the, this, the discussion that is um, uh, ongoing about the discrepancies in the measurements of H naught that come from CMB versus what comes from supernova. We could be able to put a measurement there with an error bar that is small enough to, 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 to have something to say if we can detect uh, this number of events. And that's, a, that's quite exciting uh, future prospect and something that is motivating to me. So um, I like to look at that cartoon that I showed earlier, but I also like to look at this plot. And I think that we made, I think, some significant steps in this direction. So um, in Summary, uh, these are really exciting times for the dark energy survey for a number of reasons, including the fact that we are able to produce the largest and um, deepest searches for optical counterparts to gravitational waves. Um, it's been a blast, it's been really fun to work on this project. I'm learning a lot and I'm having the opportunity to work with uh, great people. Uh, we are right now preparing uh, for run two. Should start um, soon, in a matter of like a couple weeks, no, a few weeks, and uh, that means that soon we are going to to have more results. I hope to be able to come back here and tell us, tell you guys about run two, what we found, and uh, how exciting it is. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. We have plenty of time for questions. So, um, you, you could, in principle, have a kind of hard to black hole binders, not just neutron storage. 
you going to look for those too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the idea is, um, okay, for the case of the neutral stars, uh, we have models that are that that make it the the search that make the search here the design of the search easier and more um, concrete based on concrete models. For the case of uh, binary black holes, the, we don't really have good guidance from the theoretical side, but we are planning to do specific search. So one of the improvements for version 2.0 of this is that now we have two different strategies. In the case of binary black holes, we are probably not going to go for I and Z detection uh, uh, images because the color information there is probably not going to be as useful as going for area coverage. Uh, the idea there is if the, let's say cartoon, right, is um, similar mechanism as to what generates uh, the um, GRBs. And the idea would be looking for a signature that would be somewhat similar to a GRB afterglow. So something that would be fast decaying but bluer. And we probably will go for I-band observations because that's uh, more robust against moon and, and so, and try to cover as much area as possible to put limits on what is the emission. So that's 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 going to be part of the program. Yes. I have a couple of questions about the neutron star neutron star mergers. Um, first, what is the rise time that you expect? Like, is it ever possible to see it on the rise in the optical? So. Um, Again, there are huge uncertainties on the models, but uh, this red emission, the rise time should be like a couple of days. So if we would be able to be on sky the same night off, we could see at least one data point on the rise and the rise is inside. side. Okay, and then the second question is that the possibility that it's in the LMC must have been very exciting for a day or two. And I wonder, um, with neutron star burgers, would you, out to what distance would you expect to see neutrinos, and what uh, experiments could could they analyze the data in real time and then tell everyone, yes, there was a very nearby neutron star neutron star Uh You mean? Okay, so I think I'm not. Uh, I don't have well, the right expertise for 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 neutrino experiments. So as far as as. I know the neutrino detectors cannot see beyond the LMC at all today. Okay. So whatever event would, ha would happen, if it would be outside of our own galaxy or beyond the LMC, uh, detection via neutrinos, I think it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Okay, other That, that was very nice. Um, I just was unbiased, but that was very nice. Um, I was wondering, what is the fastest we could process? The so after we take take the images, what what's the earliest we could have you know, a candidate that, that we would then have? Okay, if everything goes well, right? Optimistic scenario. Um, minimum amount of time you need. You need to do the single effort processing on the images you just took. And that takes, um, optimistically, that takes a couple of hours. With the latest parallelizations that we did, we can do that in a little bit less than two hours, but let's say two hours. And then um, the difference imaging itself, if we can parallelize everything and run all, everything in parallel, we could do the processing um, it doesn't take very long, it takes less, less than an hour uh, to do everything. If you do like all the 60 chips in parallel and so on. And then another maybe hour for post-processing. I'm looking at Rick here to, to correct. So I would, I would say that five hours after, I, would, I, I think. But that would be a very ideal scenario. So yeah, yes. Actually, okay, depending on how we do this, and we did a few uh, tests with um, the Amazon Cloud uh, uh, servers and so on, 
uh, we could keep up actually with the data rate. So we were feeding the images every four minutes, assuming like an overhead, etc. And we were able to almost keep up with the, with the image production. And then like I think three hours after the last image came in, we had the last jobs going going in, you know. So we could we could do things um, quite quickly. Right now, one thing that we are doing is we are running mostly in a like opportunistic way, which means we submit the jobs to the grid and use whatever resources are available at Fermilab or whatever else in the world. Um, we could go for, and we were talking about this, I think, uh, with uh, Josh the other day, we could go for something that would be like more dedicated for a short period of time. And that was the idea with the Amazon Cloud, because there you can buy a certain allocation and say, like, I'm going to process this. Right? And in that case, we could, we could do things faster. Um, but we haven't tried to push to that level yet. Uh, I, I mean, the dream scenario would be to be able to, like, in the same night, right, do the detections and then do the spectroscopic follow-up. But that would be, I think, maybe run three. <laughs> yeah. There's a question there in the back. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, can you anticipate any, like, shrinking of the search regions this time goes on? Shrinking? The what? Like reduction of the space that needs to be searched as time goes on. Oh, the spatial there. area. Yeah. yeah. So we're really looking forward to when uh, Virgo comes online. Because with three detectors, the localization areas will like shrink by a factor of a lot, a factor of a few, let's say. And then instead of hundreds of square degrees, you're talking about tens of square degrees. And then we can really uh, say not only cover once the area, but we can like uh, go back and do the same thing or uh, dithering and, and covering the gaps, for instance, and do um, or go deeper and, uh, and do a great, I think, uh, for instance, for the purpose of what um, Craig was asking, which was like, okay, um, we could look for emission for binary black holes and put limits um, on what level of emission that is, which would translate into limits on how dense the environment where the mergers are happening is, and, and we could learn a lot of astrophysics, uh, or at least guide the uh, astrophysical modeling of those systems um, that way. Um, but it's, uh, I, I think it will, it will require at least three detectors for that to happen. With two detectors, the typical localization area will be like I showed here for event number one. Oh, something else. <laughs> Could you go back to the slide about the cuts that you did? In sure. 2016? And uh, you had the se second to last step, you had nine candidates and then went down to zero. Um, yes. Yeah, can you, can you explain again the third cut there? What is it supposed to rule out? Okay, so uh, remember that we are looking for a light curve that is decaying on a time scale of two weeks or less. And these Third epoch, I did not highlight that enough on here, but it was taken uh, more than three weeks after the trigger. So the idea is any candidate that remains with detectable light on the third epoch is decaying too slow to be our candidate, so it's rejected. And there were uh, a few of those left and they, they, they dropped after this cut. So for all nine of those, you could still see the thing? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, for all nine of those, there was still some light on the third epoch. So the flux had declined from first to second epoch, but was still present in the third epoch. They hadn't de so either, you know, de declined a little bit in plateaus or declined but not fast enough. That's the idea. Or, or comes back up, right? We don't have data points in between to actually know if it came back up. Okay, I, I would would have uh, done a signal cut rather than a signal to noise cut. Uh, no, this is um, this means consistent with zero at the three signal level, right? Right. Yeah. I'll read the paper. <laughs> Uh, especially for, for black hole, black hole mergers, what other sort of wave bands are optimal to try to find you know, the counterparts in that respect? Uh, with X-rays or gamma rays, 
is sort of ideal. But what was the SED of one of those things look like? Okay. Uh, we don't really have good models for that, but assuming that a scenario that would be the same mechanism that powers a GRB, right? So the idea would be that the same machinery that goes, uh, the same um, instruments that go after uh, ma uh, detecting afterglow of uh, gamma ray bursts would be well matched to this. And, and actually people are doing this, right? So. Uh, that is uh, one of the, let's say, main line for the type of uh, uh, searches for, this, for counterparts that are not optical, right? Right. But you could think of pure optical infrared. Yeah. Well, like SP3G, yeah. orphan GRBs, you know, maybe that's actually. Yeah, I mean, GRBs are oh. probably black and white. Black and white. Basically, there's an accretion to this. Yes. In the Suddenly, there's five percent of its maximum potential. This gives an efficient discharge. It doesn't give you a lot of light stuff, it just blows it. Right. Mm -hmm. That would be a model. Can you write a light curve that we can roll <laughs> 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 There are orphan GRBs, uh, SED models, mm -hmm. right? usually if you can not far IR. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so people are uh, looking for, for counterparts, but um, in radio it's not. So do you have plans to use Rigi to go after? Uh, we're, we're, we're thinking about it. I mean, we're trying to write the pipeline so it's a little more fast responding to the number of transits. Actually, I have some fair questions uh -huh. about our uh, So there was a claim of a detection So my understanding there is that um, okay there was this um, so just for context if um, people are not aware of what we're talking about um, the um, Fermi um, GRB uh, collaboration and uh, looked into their data and found an event at um, I don't know what significance anymore. I forget. Um, but they found an event that was within a fraction of a second from the trigger, and that was exciting. And so they did an analysis of trying to say, okay, these two things are associated with each other. How can we combine the localization areas, and how can we interpret this as something like a GRB uh, being associated with the merger of binary black hole? And my interpretation, especially after seeing the talks um, by uh, members of the collaboration at the APS meeting, was that people were being, well, some people were being over excited about it, but most, I think, uh, people are being a little bit cautious and trying to, okay, let's wait and see. We um, once we have more results, so what, if it happens again, and what, once we have more data and more events. Um, and uh, see if this can be confirmed. So I think people are uh, taking it with a grain of salt. I don't know, I think. Yeah, I, mean, uh, um, I, mean, I think that's a uh, good uh -huh. description. But for example, some of the authors of the original paper have subsequently written a paper claiming that it's incorrect, that there is no, uh, mm -hmm. that it's you know, some statistical issue. Sure. And now there's a big argument between those groups that it's, so it's certainly not resolved, but I think uh, it, certainly the consensus is not in favor at this point. Okay, well I think uh, it's time to go for uh, the piece, et cetera, upstairs, fourth floor, so let's take Marcelia. Yeah.